through cancer diagnosis all the time using FNA. We lost the slides, by the way. Sorry to interrupt here, but I don't think, is everybody seeing the slides or no? Because I don't see anything right now. I lost mine for a second, but it, mine is back up. Okay. Is any... <clears throat> I may have the dict file and so what recorded. So it's not my that I saw recorded. So I'm going to host it. Let's let's hide it. Okay. So if you can return to the slides after we lost it, I'm going to return to it. It's a host. Yes. It's not a share or something. Yeah. Amy, can you please share the your screen again, like you did the first time? Yeah. Let me try. Thank you. And and while you add it, a couple of things. There is like a, a bubble in the bottom of your of our screen or my screen. So you say live caption and subtitle. Are you able just to hit the got it and? Uh, oh, sorry. You, yeah. Do you see it? Yeah, it's weird. It's only on yeah. one of my screens. Yeah, but not that's the other. fine. Yeah, and, and the last thing is that for the audience, uh, FNA is fine needle aspirates, just in case. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, core needle biopsy is the preferred way to biopsy something in the breast. Um, this is uh, minimally invasive. It um, retrieves tissue and allows us to make um, an accurate diagnosis of a cancer or a lesion in the breast. Um, it is highly accurate for diagnosing cancer and the pathologist is able to tell us um, grade, um, estrogen progesterone receptors, HER2, um, so we really can make um, uh, good uh, treatment decisions based on a core needle biopsy. The core needle biopsy can be done multiple ways. Um, we use ultrasound guided if it is a lesion that's seen on ultrasound. If it's a lesion that's only seen on mammograms, such as calcifications or density, then we have to do it stereotactically, um, which uses the mammogram as the guide. We tried to reserve surgical biopsy for um, uh, lesions that we have already done a needle biopsy of and we know need surgical excision. Um, we try to avoid doing surgical biopsy for diagnosis, um, particularly of cancer, because if you do a surgical biopsy and it ends up being cancer, you frequently have to do additional surgery such as axillary staging or additional surgery for margins. So we really try to get a diagnosis before we go to the operating room. So now we'll go into um, a more specific talk about cancer and treatment. Um, DCIS is ductal carcinoma in situ. This is typically the way DCIS presents. Um, it uh, presents as uh, microcalcifications on mammogram. They're frequently clustered together in a group like this, pleomorphic, and this is a classic look for DCIS. Sometimes this can present as a mass and sometimes it can present as uh, bloody nipple discharge, but uh, microcalcifications are the most common presentation. This is a precursor lesion. Um, uh, DCIS frequently, if you leave it, um, will become in, will uh, progress to invasive ductal carcinoma. There is some level of concern for overtreatment. Um, we know there is some DCIS that will never progress to invasive cancer, but right now we really don't know which DCIS is okay to not treat and which requires treatment. So really outside of a clinical trial, all DCIS should be treated. Um, we are doing observational trials for DCIS though in the US. So um, it'll really be interesting to see how those play out. And if we can uh, get an answer to, uh, is there some DCIS that we can observe? Um, Standard treatment for DCIS is either lumpectomy followed by radiation or mastectomy. And the decision for which to do really depends on the imaging. If it's just localized um, microcalcifications, such as on this image, this patient would be a great candidate for a lumpectomy if this is her only area of abnormality on imaging. 
Um, but there are times when there are widespread malignant appearing calcifications, and then those women really need mastectomy. Um, you can give tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor if the disease is ER positive, and that's not so much for treatment. It's more for risk reduction for future breast cancer events. Um, and DCIS, of course, does not require chemotherapy because it um, is non-invasive. Uh, invasive breast cancers um, can present many different ways. Um, ideally, we like to diagnose these when they're asymptomatic, just on routine screening imaging. Um, on mammogram, they'll frequently show up as a speculated mass. You would then do an ultrasound and then an ultrasound-guided corneal biopsy. Um, sometimes can present as a palpable mass, um, more so in women who are not getting imaging or screening done. Uh, sometimes skin dimpling. Um, so if a woman has skin dimpling, even if there's no palpable mass, even if her mammogram is benign, she really should have an ultrasound. I've seen it where um, all other imaging and, and there was no mass on clinical exam, but on ultrasound, there was a, a cancer there. Um, bloody nipple discharge sometimes can be a sign of invasive cancer. Uh, nipple inversion, pain is less common. Um, most breast pain is physiologic and not um, pathologic. Um, so thankfully, uh, with that pain being so common in women, we can reassure most patients that it's not a sign of breast cancer. Many different um, histologies for breast cancer. Uh, ductal and lobular are most common, but they're uh, mixed, tubular, mucinous, papillary, medullary, metaplastic, kind of increasing in aggressiveness as you go down the list there. Um, surgical treatment, uh, uh, lumpectomy um, versus mastectomy. Again, we make the decision for um, which surgery to do based on the imaging. Um, if there is a, if the lesion uh, or the cancer is small enough to get it out with a reasonably good cosmetic result, then we try to do lumpectomy. Um, if it's a very large area uh, or there are multiple cancers in the breast, then sometimes we have to do mastectomy. Uh, in some of those women who have large cancers, you can give neoadjuvant uh, treatment, either neoadjuvant uh, or preoperative chemotherapy or endocrine therapy to try and shrink the cancer. And if the cancer does shrink, then sometimes those women may be candidates for lumpectomy, and we've had good results with that. And then um, women need axillary staging with sentinel lymph node biopsy. And um, if we can, we try to... Um, provide oncoplastic surgery because again, we have excellent success with breast cancer treatment. Most of these women go on to be survivors and you know we want them as comfortable as they can be with their um, results of their breast and surgical treatment. Multiple randomized controlled trials have shown lumpectomy with radiation to be equivalent to mastectomy for early stage breast cancer. So you know when I see women in the office with newly diagnosed breast cancer, um, a lot of times I have to talk them out of bilateral mastectomies. They come into the office um, just certain that they want bilateral mastectomies because they think, you know, being more surgically aggressive is better, but it's part of my job to educate them that that necessarily is not true. Oncoplastic surgery combines um, breast surgery with plastic surgery for the best cosmetic result. When we think of oncoplastic surgery, I think a lot of us think of reconstruction in women who have had mastectomy, but you can actually do oncoplastic surgery with lumpectomies to try and, um, uh, you know, preserve the shape of the breast. Um, women can have um, women who have very large breasts um, who would like a breast reduction can sometimes have a reduction done with their lumpectomy. Um, they can have tissue rearrangement done to try and fill in the defect created by a lumpectomy. This is a bat wing type of uh, uh, lumpectomy where um, you create these flaps and then uh, provides a nice closure there. So lots of different options for um, uh, preserving the shape of the breast. <coughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about mastectomy now. 
radical mastectomy thankfully has become kind of a historical procedure. We really don't do this anymore. It really is not necessary. Um, this was removal of the breast, um, the axillary lymph nodes, um, pectoralis uh, major and pectoralis minor as well. And even for women who present with um, chest wall invasion, we can give preoperative chemotherapy to try and shrink the cancer. And those women do not need um, radical um, uh, resection of their muscles at the time of surgery. Modified radical mastectomy, um, removal of the breast and the axillary lymph nodes. Um, this is still done uh, in women with uh, lymph node involvement. Um, that need an axillary lymph node dissection and to need mastectomy. Um, for women having reconstruction, we do skin sparing mastectomy where we leave a large amount of the um, skin of the breast to um, use for the reconstruction. <clears throat> you still have to do an adequate um, oncologically safe procedure. Um, so even though you're using a limited incision, you still need to remove the breast um, in an oncologically safe manner. Um, this is an image of a woman who had a skin sparing mastectomy with implant reconstruction. Um, women uh, can have reconstruction of the nipple and tattooing of the areola. I find a lot of women don't end up going back for that. Um, I'd say probably if if a quarter of women, if 25% go back for the nipple areola reconstruction, I'd be surprised. I think women, by the time they get to that point, just get tired of, of doctors and, and procedures. Um, but you can see she still has a nice shape to her reconstructed breast. Um, this is a woman who um, had bilateral DCIS and she had bilateral uh, mastectomies. She had nipple areola reconstruction. This is a woman with a BRCA1 mutation who did not have breast cancer. Um, she had nipple sparing mastectomies with implant reconstruction. We're trying to do more nipple sparing mastectomies because it really preserves the shape of the breast well. Um, the breast doesn't have kind of that cut off appearance at the end and it just has such a more natural cosmetic result. Um, it really is more of a cosmetic um, benefit uh, as opposed to a functional benefit. Most women have um, just uh, a lot of numbness. Uh, they really lack sensation in the nipple and the reconstructed breast, but cosmetically it just looks more natural. The optimal patients for nipple spraying mastectomy um, are women with small non-totic breasts, women who are healthy and non-smokers, women with smaller size tumors, and you must be able to obtain clear margins, um, particularly at the nipple and areola. <clears throat> you again can't compromise your oncologic surgery for cosmesis ever, um, and so you see here um, women, even though they have preservation of the nipple and the areola, you know, she's had a good mastectomy here. And this is um, everting the nipple and the areola. You really make this area very thin to remove as much of that ductal tissue as you can. Um, the downside of doing uh, nipple and areolar preservation is there's a little bit increased risk of complications. Because we make this area so thin, um, women can um, get ischemia to the tissue there. Um, they can have loss of the nipple. They frequently have loss of some pigmentation if they have any ischemia. But most women actually do fine. Um, any woman with invasive breast cancer, you have to consider staging their axilla. The way that we do axillary staging is with sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, the uh, cancer will metastasize to the sentinel lymph nodes first, and if these lymph nodes are benign, then you really don't need to remove any additional lymph nodes. The way that we identify which lymph nodes are the sentinel lymph nodes are with a radioactive dye and a blue dye, 
and we have a little handheld probe that we use to identify where the radioactive lymph nodes are, and then um, we can see the blue dye in the lymphatics and the, and the lymph nodes. And this really um, revolutionized uh, axillary staging for breast cancer. Um, when I first started residency, we were doing axillary lymph node dissection on every woman with invasive breast cancer, and it's got a lot of morbidity to it. And it's really a shame that those women had such aggressive surgery when, frankly, a lot of women didn't have disease in their axilla. Um, and as you know, uh, women were frequently left with uh, lymphedema. Um, thankfully, I don't think most women get a wing scapula, um, but it is a risk of the surgery. And then um, axillary cording, which is common after axillary surgery, but this can be helped with physical therapy. Um, now a little bit about systemic treatment. Um, I tell women frequently in my office that uh, a lot of times we cannot um, cure breast cancer just with surgery alone. I rely on my colleagues to um, uh, treat women with their uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Um, and many women with breast cancer require chemotherapy. Of course, this decreases the risk for distant recurrence. Um, we use this for ERPR negative cancers, triple negative breast cancers, um, HER2 positive breast cancers, and then uh, many ERPR positive breast cancers. Um, we use um, Oncotype DX. I don't know if you guys have this um, in Iraq. Um, this is uh, genomic testing of the tumor. We use this uh, for women who uh, have ER positive, does ER positive for two negative breast cancers. Um, and this really has helped us identify which women require chemotherapy. Um, uh, it um, tests 21 different genes um, and it, based on those results, uh, provides a recurrence score which is the risk of, risk of distant recurrence within 10 years. And as the recurrence score goes up, the risk of distant recurrence goes up. And this um, is predictive of the benefit to chemotherapy. Um, this is the um, patients treated with tamoxifen alone. And then this is patients treated with tamoxifen and chemo. You see as the recurrence score goes up, the benefit to chemotherapy goes up. So for women with low scores, there really is no benefit to chemotherapy. So for this patient who has a score of three, we know she does not need chemotherapy and it's not gonna benefit her. The cutoff really is 25. Any woman with a score over 25 um, should have chemotherapy. And then women under the age of 15 who have scores between 15 and 25, um, there is some benefit to chemotherapy. But anyone with a score um, of 15 or lower has uh, no benefit to chemotherapy. And we even started using this in women with node positive disease, postmenopausal women with node positive disease. Um, radiation therapy. Radiation therapy, of course, decreases the risk for local recurrence. Um, we consider this for any woman having a lumpectomy for breast cancer. And then women who have mastectomy need radiation therapy if they have an increased risk for local recurrence. So women with large tumors, tumor over five centimeters, lymph node involvement, or a positive margin. There are many ways that women can get radiation for breast cancer. Whole breast is the um, primary way we use it. Um, partial breast radiation and intraoperative radiation. Um, partial breast radiation is just uh, radiating the area where the lumpectomy was done. Um, this was started with uh, multi-catheter uh, brachytherapy. Um, but then they, as you can see, this doesn't look very pleasant and it looks fairly cumbersome. And then they develop these um, catheters that can be placed into the lumpectomy site that deliver the radiation kind of from the inside of the lumpectomy cavity out. 
Um, the downside to this is um, you have to leave the lumpectomy cavity kind of open on the inside. Um, typically, I close the lumpectomy cavity on the inside, um, but you leave the cavity open to accommodate the device. And then I found women get um, uh, really bad persistent seromas afterwards. Um, so I have not been a fan of these um, uh, balloon catheters. Um, probably the most common way that they're giving it now is just external beam. Uh, they can do a partial breast radiation where they're just um, radiating the area of the lumpectomy um, externally. Uh, intraoperative radiation is something being done um, in the U.S. It's still fairly investigational in the U.S. I, they're, they're doing it more in Europe. Um, where the radiation is given in the operating room at the time of lumpectomy. Um, it can be given either through this uh, column or uh, a device that's put um, into the lumpectomy cavity. They're sometimes using this instead of giving a boost. Um, our radiation oncologists here are, are still not convinced. Um, so we haven't been doing this at our institution, but it's something that is um, interesting. I mean, if women can come out of the operating room having completed their surgery and their radiation, and that would really be fantastic. But our, our radiation oncologists are still um, a little skeptical. Um, endocrine therapy. Uh, this is used to treat uh, ERPR positive cancers. Of course, the first was tamoxifen. Roloxifen is just used for, for prevention, not for treatment. And then the aromatase inhibitors, um, they really, this really was the first targeted therapy we had. Um, who knew how far we'd come in targeted uh, treatment, really targeted treatment for breast cancer and probably all cancers is really going to be the future of cancer treatment. Um, the uh, HER2 uh, receptor has become a, a target that we're um, uh, using frequently for HER2 positive cancers. Uh, the original uh, drug was transtuzumab. Now we have many, many different HER2-targeted uh, drugs, pertuzumab, um, many others that we can use for uh, patients with HER2-positive disease. Um, and, you know, the, the systemic treatment has just really exploded in the last five years, and it, it really has um, improved outcomes. Um, using immunotherapy now. Um, it's just incredible. So now I'm going to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about genetic testing. Um, genetic testing, you know, I think when we think about genetic testing, we always think about BRCA1 and 2. These are, you know, the, the big genes that we think of when we think of breast cancer. Um, as you know, these are inherited autosomal dominant. Um, so who should have genetic testing? Any family members with a known mutation in the family, um, patients with a family history of breast and ovarian cancer, women with cancer under the, or women with breast cancer under the age of 50, women who are Jewish with breast cancer, any woman with ovarian cancer, and then, oh, this is, I need to update this slide. Really now it's any woman with triple negative breast cancer. They don't have to be under the age of 60. And then also um, any patient with pancreatic cancer and metastatic prostate cancer are all indications for genetic testing. Um, Amy, can you just uh, let them know what triple negative is? <clears throat> yeah, um, triple negative breast cancer is ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 negative. Um, and we tend to see those cancers associated with a BRCA1 mutation. So that's why any woman with that type of breast cancer should have genetic testing to make sure it's not a BRCA1 mutation. So oh, well, oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I was wondering how about family history of male with a breast cancer? I think that's all. Yes. Oh, yes. I forgot that. Thank you. I really need to update that slide. I'm missing no one slide. <laughs> no worries. Sorry. It's okay. But you're right. Yes. Any male with breast cancer. Um, BRCA1 is located on chromosome 17. Um, 
primarily increases the risk for breast and ovarian cancer. And these um, women tend to get the more aggressive triple negative breast cancers. BRCA2 is located on chromosome 13. These cancers tend to be more favorable. They tend to be ERPR positive cancers, tend to be a little later age of onset. BRCA1, those are women that commonly you'll see diagnosed in their 20s, 30s, 40s. BRCA2 tends to um, uh, be a little bit um, older age. Um, uh, these, this um, uh, increases the risk not only for breast and ovarian cancer, but also male breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, a um, little bit of melanoma and colon and GI, but mainly the others. The BRCA uh, genes significantly increase the risk for breast and ovarian cancer. Um, lifetime risk, uh, depending on what study you look at, can be over 80% for breast cancer. And um, I think this shows it a little bit high for ovarian cancer. I think most of us think 20 to 40% risk of ovarian cancer, but still significantly higher than the general population. So um, how do we manage women with a BRCA mutation? So this is um, patients who do not have cancer at the time of their genetic testing, um, which is ideally when you wanna identify these women, not when they're diagnosed with cancer. Um, they should have clinical breast exam every six months, annual mammogram alternating with breast MRI. And again, you start their screening in, uh, in between the ages of 25 and 30. Um, tamoxifen, I, we don't, this is not a commonly used thing. Um, certainly if, if a woman um, was gonna take it, it it uh, would, you'd expect it to be more beneficial for the BRCA2 carriers. Um, BRCA1 carriers tend to have the triple negative breast cancer, so you wouldn't expect as much benefit from the tamoxifen. And then all women should consider prophylactic mastectomies. Um, ovarian cancer, um, they should have clinical exam. You can consider uh, annual pelvic ultrasound, CA125. Uh, birth control pills will uh, reduce the risk of uh, ovarian cancer, and then those women um, should have prophylactic BSO, um, particularly um, uh, when they reach the age of four, uh, 40, I believe is what the recommendations are for that. Um, but it also depends on their family history and when the women in the family were getting their ovarian cancer. And really, um, uh, the genetic testing has expanded considerably over the last several years. We're not only testing for beer. BRCA mutations now. When women have genetic testing, they have a um, panel of genes tested for. Um, so we're identifying so many more mutations now. Um, the BRCA mutations are certainly the very highest risk mutations, but we're identifying now the more moderate risk. Um, so um, uh, seeing a lot of ATM, of check mutations, um, uh, P10, um, uh, PAL B2, so um, uh, genes that uh, increase the risk for breast cancer, but maybe not quite as significantly as BRCA1 does. But you know, without ever testing previously for these gene mutations, it's really been interesting to see these mutations more commonly. Um, and I really believe that um, women should have their genetic testing um, done before they are diagnosed with cancer. So um, I always, when I talk to the medical students and the residents, um, for the students going into primary care, I think it's so important to do a family history um, and identify these families um, and get their testing done so they can have appropriate screening. Um, I have uh, a couple patient examples. I had a patient who was diagnosed with breast cancer very early I think she was 40 when she was diagnosed and we did genetic testing and she had a BRCA1 mutation and she had her BSO done at the time of her prophylactic mastectomies and she had a fallopian tube cancer that was found incidentally. So that probably saved her life because those are aggressive cancers. Um, and it was so early, she was essentially cured of that malignancy. Um, and then I have another patient who had um, ovarian cancer and never had treatment for it, never had genetic testing, came to me with bilateral breast cancer. 
and we did genetic testing then. And last I heard she had metastatic breast cancer. So if she would have been undergoing appropriate screening, if she would have had genetic testing done when she was diagnosed with her ovarian cancer, she probably would have added MRI to her breast cancer screening or possibly had prophylactic mastectomies and, and maybe her outcome would have been different. So very important to um, do a good comprehensive family history for the primary care doctors and refer patients for genetic testing. Um, and I think that's it. Does okay. anybody have any questions? Yeah. So Amy, I, I think you, you think you're done, but however, uh, the recording of these sessions started a little bit few slides. So I know uh, if I'm gonna ask you kindly, if you can just repeat the first three slides of your presentation. You want me to <laughs> so Just go back, catch your breath and I'll, I'll talk to the attendants. And uh, uh, so whoever, uh, مهما كان السؤال حتى إذا تصورون إنه مو مناسب أو عندكم أفكار أخرى أريد نسمعها من عندكم دكتور إيمي أقدر أترجم إذا تفضلون إنه تحجون بالعربي أقدر أترجم السؤال وإذا تفضلون تسألون بالإنجليزي تقدرون تسألوها فراح ننطيها إنه تسوي الثلاث سلايدات بعدين رجعان حتى إذا ما عندكم أسئلة أرجو من الحضور إذا يشاركون شنو خبرتهم او شنو الاشياء اللي هم يسووها حاليا او يعرفون اذا ما يسووها شنو اللي درسوا او على مود نعرف شنو وضع سرطان الثدي بالعراق واذا نقدر نساعد بهذا الموضوع. ايمي جو هيد يو كان جو فور ذا فيرست ثري او فور سلايدز. اوكي. It'll be interesting to see if I say anything similar to what I said before. Um, okay, so uh, First, we'll talk about breast cancer screening. Um, this is very controversial. Uh, there are many different guidelines in the United States. Um, NCCN, um, our National Cancer Treatment Guidelines, and uh, ACR, the American College of Radiology, are what we follow here at my hospital. Um, the US Preventative Services Task Force uh, their recommendations came out years ago and recommend women ages 40 to 44 should discuss screening with their doctor. Um, and then uh, women ages 50 to 74 should undergo a mammogram every two years. Um, the American Cancer Society changed their guidelines several years ago to women between the ages of 45 and 54 should get annual mammograms. And women over the age of, uh, women 55 plus should get mammograms every two years. Um, but again, at our hospital, we recommend um, annual mammograms beginning at age 40, and women should continue screening until their life expectancy is less than 10 years. And um, breast cancer is common. Uh, it's the most common cancer in women. Um, they, we estimate that one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point in their life. Um, in the U.S., we have more than 300,000 cases annually, and it's expected that over 40,000 women will die of breast cancer annually. And there are millions of breast cancer survivors, and that is due to our ability to screen women and detect these cancers early um, and our excellent um, advances in treatment. So... Screening mammography came out in the late 80s, and um, since that time, we've shown a significant reduction in breast cancer deaths. So this is, these, this is um, uh, breast cancer deaths per 100,000 women, and you see that in the late 80s, with the introduction of mammography, uh, there is a reduction in breast cancer deaths by hundreds of thousands of women. Multiple randomized controlled trials uh, showed uh, benefit, at least a 20% reduction in breast cancer deaths in women between the ages of 40 and 74. Observational studies have shown a mortality reduction of about 40%, and studies have even shown benefit for women over the age of 74. And um, there has been a bit of a push. The US Preventive Services Task Force doesn't recommend screening in women over the age of 74, but I really think it's a disservice to not screen these women, um, particularly if they're um, 
uh, health is good and they're leading active lives. Why should women start at age 40 um, uh, as opposed to waiting later, uh, like the American Cancer Society and US Preventive Services Task Force recommend? Well, one in six women, or sorry, one in six breast cancers are found in women ages 40 to 49. So it's not uncommon for women in their 40s to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, the risk of a woman being diagnosed with breast cancer in her 40s is one in 69. And about a third of the years lost of life from breast cancer are in women in their 40s. Women in their uh, 40s are women who are younger, who are diagnosed with breast cancer, tend to get more aggressive breast cancers. And so it's very important for us to diagnose these women earlier so that um, hopefully they're, um, they will do well with treatment. I think this is good, right, Dr. Yeah, yeah. so Amy, if you can just uh, uh, put the slide of the model that we use and just let it you know, go there, you don't have to comment on it, just so the, some people that have joined later, they can you know, see the models that uh, you know, we follow. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Amy. Do you want me to explain this? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, just a little bit uh, short, you know, and then we'll uh, have, you know, the uh, discussion. But go ahead and explain and what do we use and why we use the entire okay. group. Okay. Um, so uh, we, women um, uh, need to have a risk analysis done, particularly women with a family history of breast cancer. Um, the way that we estimate a woman's lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is by using one of these uh, statistical models. Um, the original one that was uh, used was Gale, and this was the one that was used in the prevention trials looking at the use of tamoxifen for breast cancer prevention. Uh, but this is probably our most limited trial because it only takes into account first degree family members. Um, the one that is probably the most helpful now is Tyra Kruzak. Um, this uh, takes into account extended family history, um, menstrual history, um, uh, BMI, and then the most recent version of this even takes into account breast density, which um, is an independent risk factor for breast cancer. So the Tyra Kruzak model is probably our most helpful. I mean, thank you, thank you very much. Actually, uh, even it was very interesting to me, and I, you know, we studied this in our general surgery days, you know, but I've been a little bit, uh, you know, away from it for a while. So I'm sure everybody has uh, enjoyed it. Uh, we have a couple of, you know, there's a question in the chat, and I know there's- First, Dr. Here. Florence, first, I would like to thank you, Dr. Emmy, uh, for yeah. excellent, uh, excellent uh, information about the breast cancer. Thank you for joining uh, uh, with us our on the Hippocratic platform uh, to share uh, your experience and information about breast cancer to the doctor and the medical personnel uh, and the medical field employees. Uh, thanks a lot for replying the slides uh, from the beginning. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Amy, one question in the chat, I don't know if you had the access to it, and basically it was, you know, how would you manage uh, a bilateral breast cancer that one side is an invasive ductal and the other side is a DCIS? Um, it, it depends on the extent of the abnormality on imaging. If, if both areas look like they are amenable to lumpectomy, then I think I would treat them with lumpectomy, but I would only do a sentinel lymph node biopsy or actually staging on the side with the invasive cancer. And then that patient would need um, postoperative bilateral radiation. Um, but that patient should also have genetic testing done um, because having bilateral breast cancer is an indication for genetic testing. So um, I would include that. And um, certainly if there was a a gene mutation suggesting her risk of future breast cancers is really high, then you'd have to have that discussion with her if she wants to be more surgically aggressive. Okay. And more surgically aggressive meaning bilateral. Uh, bilateral mastectomies. All right, I think we have uh, Seja, uh, she raised, is that a she or he raised her hand? So go ahead. Uh, hi, Dr. First of okay. all, I would, 
Uh, hi, doctors. First of all, I would uh, like to thank Dr. Amy and you for this nice presentation. Uh, secondly, may I ask you, uh, uh, regarding the oncoplastic surgery, what you prefer uh, you know, doing the, the whole operation in one session or two successive sessions? Yeah, so, so let me just uh, yeah, just uh, yeah. Yeah. What do you prefer to do it in the one session operation or two session? Okay, so let me uh, rephr rephrase the question, Amy. If you uh, understood, there's you know she's asking if the oncoplastic, but I think uh, uh, correct me, Sajja, if I'm wrong, is that she's asking about the the reconstructive, you know, plastic reconstructive. Uh, is it in two session or one session? And I think uh, you can answer about what's the difference between just simply oncoplastic and whether oncoplastic and you know reconstructive you know plastic surgery. Go ahead, Amy. So um, typically we've been doing the recon the mastectomy reconstruction as a two stage procedure um, where we put a tissue expander in um, and then. After the woman finishes her breast cancer treatment and she's healed up, then she has the tissue expanders removed and the permanent implants put in. Um, in some cases, you can go direct to implant, um, direct to the um, permanent silicone implant, but the downside to doing that, um, and you know, for us, jump in if you have anything to add, um, is when you, after the mastectomy, the blood supply to the flaps can be tenuous. And um, if you put a full implant underneath that flap, there's more risk of uh, flap necrosis and healing problems. And so putting the tissue expander in and gradually expanding the implant while the flaps heal um, can give you a, a better result. And so that's why we we've mainly been doing things that way and we're less likely to go direct to implant. Okay. And, and I just wanna add the, in uh, you kind of mentioned it here, there's, a, there's an oncoplastic surgery and there's a reconstructive surgery. So sometimes the oncoplastic does not mean that there's a plastic surgery involved in it. It's just, you know, how to locate your, uh, you know, incisions and whether the nipple, you know, uh, preserving technique uh, for you, Sajja. The, the plastic and reconstruction, what Amy was just saying is that in generality, there is an immediate reconstruction and there is a delayed reconstruction. Some people, even if you know, they may not have access or they didn't think about reconstruction at this time, even if it was offered, they still are able to come back for a delayed reconstruction. The majority are opting for an immediate reconstruction. Now with the immediate reconstruction, that means something is done at the time of the mastectomy. So once the mastectomy is completed and the lymph node, whether it's involved or not, and whether it's unilateral or bilateral, then you can do the immediate reconstruction. In generality, and I can answer any question about that, it's either you use a, a tissue expander or an implant-based um, technique or approach, or use an autologous, meaning you use your own uh, tissue. Uh, the autologous is usually one stage and it's done at the same time, whether it's a free flap or you know pedicle flap reconstruction or a pedicle and an implant flap you know, at the same time. The breast or the implant or tissue expander, uh, it's usually two stages. However, the first stage is done at the same time of the mastectomy, and then the implant is, uh, uh, you know, placed a few months after. Uh, for two reasons, one which uh, Dr. Kirby mentioned is the vascularity of the flap is usually, usually compromised at the time of the mastectomy, and there's very limited space. So we tend to put the tissue expander and try to stretch it. The second thing is that most people or most patients will have radiation and having radiation with an expanded tissue expander will uh, be a little bit more resilient than leaving just a silicone implant. So the reconstruction with an implant, uh, like after the mastectomy immediately is very small uh, subset of patient that A, they have a good vascular, two, they, you can accommodate the size that matches the other one. 
and third, you should not expect radiation, you know, which that can change, obviously. Sajja, did we answer your question? Yeah, very satisfied. Thank you, doctor. Okay, the start Rami Naemi, Papa. تحيه طيبه لك دكتور فراس وشكرا جزيلا لك والساده المتحدثين على المحاضره اللطيفه لدي سؤالين اذا سمحتم دكتور تفضل لدينا في محافظه نينوى في مدينه الموصل التي اعيش فيها حاليا زياده عاليه جدا في معدل الاصابه بالبريست كانسر في عمر ال20 يعني فروم 20 تو 30 ييرز هل هذا الموضوع طبيعي في هذا السن خصوصا ان المدينه قد يعزوها البعض اثناء النقاشات بانه السبب الافرازات الحروب على مدى 20 عام، المشاكل النفسيه، الستريس، هل هو هذا السبب الرئيسي ام هن هناك اسباب اخرى؟ السبب السؤال الثاني هل توجد علاقه بين البريست كانسر والبرين كانسر؟ يعني حصلت حاله مع احد اقربائنا انه صار عنده بريست كانسر وافتر سيرجري افتر كيموثيرابي افتر فور ييرز صار عندها تيومر ان ذا برين فقالوا هذه احدى الكومبليكيشن احدى المضاعفات التي ممكن انه تنتقل خليه سرطانيه من البريست وتحت في بالبرين وتؤسس هناك وممكن انه تنتقل الى الدماغ وتسبب كانسر في الدماغ وتوفت على اثرها المريضه هذه هم السؤالين الذين يعني بالنسبه للسؤال الثاني تعرف شنو كان يعني نوع الورم بالدماغ هل هو كان يعني مثل جلايوما او جلايوبلاستوما او كان متاستاتيك بريست كانسر يعني في وقتها المريضه حقيقه يعني في تو ويك صارت الوفاه يعني مجرد انه أوكي. اول ام ار اي فقالوا هو ميتاستاسيس تيومر في قاعه الدماغ فقط يعني فلما سالنا قالوا كانت بريست كانسر قبل خمس سنوات قد تكون وحده من المضاعفات الرير يعني yeah. اللي ممكن انه تحدث فهل هذا الكلام دقيق؟ اوكي هسه انا راح ارجع سو دكتور كيربي سو ذا كويشن فروم ون اوف ذا اتندنس ذير تو كويشنز اكشولي هي براكتس ان ان اريا ان ا ستيت اوف نينو ويتش از نورث اوف عراق and they have noticed a significant increase in the incidence of breast cancer in women between the age of 20 and 30 in the last uh, 10 years, which is very unusual you know, for that area. And obviously it's very unusual. And uh, they are not sure if there is uh, you know, any relation to this area has been subject to significant you know, wars and military you know, action uh, over the years and whether there's you know, some Sort of radiation impacted uh, or is it common? And the second question is that um, they had a patient, a relative of the speaker, that had a breast cancer uh, that was treated with chemo and radiation and surgery. And four years later, she was diagnosed with a breast cancer without a, a tissue diagnosis. And he was asked to think if it's a metastatic breast cancer. Brain, uh, brain metastasis. Oh, did I say something? Okay, brain metastasis. I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead, Amy. So um, the first uh, question, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why suddenly there would be an increase in very young women being diagnosed with breast cancer in that area. It certainly um, is concerning, and you have to wonder environmentally what's going on. Um, in that area, I mean, I would certainly be concerned about some sort of radiation. Um, uh, you know, obviously you'd have to do genetic testing, but you know, th that wouldn't necessarily explain a sudden increase, you know, in what you would normally see in that population in that area. Um, but it's certainly something that, you know, they need to look at and follow and try and, you know, determine is there some sort of environmental um uh thing going on that caused that increased risk but yeah so just to piggyback so we're not noticing any increase in the 20 to 38 uh, at least here in the united states no okay so that's more local do, do you think and that's not the question of that this is my question um uh, i know in our area which is you know very very frowned upon here in the united states is you know inter you know family marital uh, you know uh, among and 
do you see that potentially can increase it if there's that as a factor, you know, that they marry within, you know, first cousins and all that, if, if they are genetically predisposed? Well, definitely if there's a mutation that would um, increase the chances of um, that happening. Um, you know, if there's no gene mutation in the family, you know, if there's a family history of breast cancer, then, you know, adding that as a risk factor to, um, you know, the intermarriage, that would increase the risk. So, yeah, I'm sure that could be playing a role, but still, um, you know, women in their 20s and 30s being diagnosed with breast cancer, especially the 20s, you know, that should be a rare event. And, um, you know, I, I think it's definitely something the medical community in that area needs to be investigating. But the second question is uh, breast, uh, brain cancer or, you know, metastatic breast cancer to the brain after four years, is that uh, common or possible? Um, I mean, yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, uh, typically when we see brain metastases, it is associated with other distant metastases. Um, uh, and it's more common, obviously, in the more aggressive cancers, the triple negative and the HER2 positive cancers. Um, uh, and, you know, certainly, hopefully there's treatment for it. Um, uh, in the U.S., we would, um, if it's resectable um, and it's an isolated brain metastasis, we would consider resection and then radiation. Um, they certainly can give systemic treatment as well. Um, if it's not resectable, then um, uh, radiation therapies used. They can do um, uh, stereotactic radiation or whole brain radiation. Um, but it's, uh, um, you know, certainly. Um, more common in the more aggressive cancers. The other question from the chat room is that if a male, you know, develop breast cancer, uh, what about the risk of breast cancer in the daughters? Um, well, certainly uh, they would need genetic testing. Um, uh, assuming the genetic testing comes back negative, um, I would, Still consider, I would consider, you know, the daughters to be higher risk due to the family history and a parent. Um, I would um, start their screening um, at age 40 or 10 years before the dad was diagnosed. Most men are diagnosed with breast cancer at older ages, so most likely they would start their screening at, at age 40 um, and just, you know, watch them closely. And that's assuming there's no gene mutation. If there is a gene mutation, then you, you treat them based on that. The last question we have in the chat is that, uh, does uh, lactation have uh, or has have any uh, impact on the risk of breast cancer, whether it decrease it or increase it or doesn't change that? Um, yeah, breastfeeding, particularly the longer you breastfeed, so breastfeeding for a year, um, does decrease the risk of getting breast cancer. Um, uh, it's always a challenge when a woman who's lactating comes in feeling a lump. Um, uh, it's very common to see women who are pregnant and lactating coming in. Certainly, you know, that it, the you need to rule out cancer in those women because um, uh, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding can get breast cancer. Um, but just yeah, women who have a history of breastfeeding, um, do, it does decrease breast cancer risk. Um, uh, but again, you know, breast cancer is so common. Um, I don't think the impact on their breast cancer risk is, is hugely significant, but we know it does have a, some impact. Uh, cool. Yeah, Alia, apparently you have, you raise your hand. I do have a question. Thank you <laughs> yes. so much for the presentation, Dr. Kirby. It was really wonderful. Um, my question to you, and maybe it's not too relevant to, um, um, to talking about um, um, density classification C and D. What are you currently recommending for those patients when they, it comes on their mammogram? Are you ordering automated breast ultrasound as well? I mean, it just kind of as a second modality to look at the breast uh, tissue 
and my second question is, where are insurances, and that's not related to the situation in Iraq, but what is the insurances doing about uh, those uncovered, and because they are not generally covered under the insurance or like partially covered under the insurance for those patients. So, because I struggle with that with my own practice. Yeah, that is um, a question that we really need to answer in the medical community is how to screen women with dense breast tissue. Um, right now at my institution, we're only doing 3D mammography. Um, we do not have automated breast ultrasound here. It's something um, the rate, our head radiologist and I have discussed, um, but it's not covered by most insurances. Um, it, it's something that some of the local hospitals have gotten. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I think we, this, we actually just talked about revisiting this. Should we relook at automated breast ultrasound? When we first were talking about getting it, I think um, they were starting to look at abbreviated breast MRI for women with dense breast tissue. And our radiologist was really hopeful that was going to be the thing to do. Um, but still, you know, I don't think we have clear guidelines for what to do with women with dense breast tissue and how they should be screened. Um, but we know that, you know, mammograms sometimes can fail them. And it's not terribly unusual for women to have with dense breasts to have a you know, mammogram and then four months later come in with a palpable mass and, and have a cancer. Um, so yeah, here we're just recommending 3D mammography. Um, but I, I think this is, you know, this is something that we really, really need to solve. And you know, the, the legislation where women are being informed of their breast density has kind of put the cart before the horse. Right. Yes. And we don't have, you know, clear cut guidelines for what to recommend. Um, so it's, it's very frustrating. Um, our radiologists here will not do screening whole breast ultrasound, just, you know, technician handheld ultrasound. Um, they, they just think it, it's not very useful. It gives patients a false sense of security. And so they frankly won't even let us schedule it. Um, so yeah, we, we struggle with that. What do you, do you guys do automated breast ultrasound there? So when I was in Bay city, uh, practicing there, we had automatic kind of like, I mean, we had a breast surgeon actually in our plaza and that was the way like she, how she wanted to recommend kind of to proceed with C and D uh, classification to go for uh, ABUS. And uh, we were able to get that done actually with the, with the, with the, the machine and like the, the, the study in, 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 um, in our rock radiology department at McLaren. Uh, here in Arizona, it's not the same. Uh, I have to say, we're like a little bit ahead of the game in Michigan. I think where I was practicing, it just kind of, uh, they don't have a, also ABUS everywhere. So they have been at Banner Health. Uh, they are doing kind of, um, the handheld ultrasound, total ultrasound bilaterally. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how they're kind of like compensating instead of like doing the APOS, they do the ultrasound that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's tough because ultrasound will pick up a lot of false positives and then you end up, you know, following those women for two years for a little complicated cyst or fibroadenoma. Um, but yeah, we, we need to figure this out. It's very frustrating. And um, I, I, I don't know the answer. How much do you happen to know off the top of your head how much yeah. patients were having to pay out of pocket for a bill? Yeah, they're paying about like two to $400 out of pocket. Yeah. That's a lot. And so a lot of my patients, they're waiting until they meet their deductibles and then just they get it done. Or, okay. they, or like the discussion that I have with them is maybe do it every other year because... And I tell them like the density may go down with time as you grow older and it just kind of, uh, and some of them, they just do it that way. Every other year, they will just uh, do one ultrasound with the mammogram. Mm -hmm. So that's one approach. Um, I really try to do a risk analysis on, you know, mm -hmm. any woman who comes to the office, sorry, with, um, uh, family history of breast cancer, particularly if she has dense breasts, because a lot of times I can get her risk to come back on one of the models, particularly Tyra Cruzac at over 20%. And then at least I can offer her screening MRI. 
And I really, I really second you on a screening for risk factors for genetic uh, factors because it's interesting how much you can pick up by just pulling a good history and uh, um, just kind of sending them for screening. And then uh, we have had a lot of those uh, surprise diagnoses just kind of by looking into the history a little bit more at, at depth and you can pick up kind of cases by just testing them. So I was wondering for the audience back in Iraq, what is the availability of the genetic testing back home? Like when we're speaking about the case in Nainawa or like the cases in Nainawa, like with Shimal, um, is there any possibility that those families get at least tested to rule out a possibility of genetic cancer syndrome? I think there is no availability for genetic studying in, the, in Mosul. So BRCA gene test is not available. No, no, no. Well, we did it outside the area. We did it وهي بالنسبة للفحوصات الجينية يعني هي موضوعها وكلش طويلة يعني ربيت أتحدث به بالأخير بالنسبة لي ده يعني أعمل مختبرات اللي هي عندها قدرة على العمل فحوصات الجينية خاصة اللي الجين الفحصين اللي قالتنا الدكتورة أمي اللي هو BRC1 و BRC2 اللي براكا 1 براكا 2 لأنه خاصات بالبريست كانسر والأوفريان كانسر طبعا اشتغلت على هواي الاطباء اللي بالحارثيه وثقفت على هذا الموضوع انه اي واحد يجيكم او اي وحده تجيكم بريست كانسر يا ريت تحول اختها امها بيتها لهذا الفحص غالبا هم يجون يسالون اوكي انترستد هذا الفحص بس ينصدمون بالتكلفه مالته التكلفه ما تعرفين الفحوصات الجينيه تكلفتها عاليه فيقول لك انا يعني حتى لو مصابه يعني شريد اعرف اوكي انا مصابه خلاص وفي مال لا هاي ما يسووا جدا الجينيتك ستدي عندنا هنا بالعراق شويه يحتاج لها شغل بعد يعني هوايه حتى العالم شلون ما يكون ثقافه الفحوصات الجينيه تتطور اكثر وتصير يعني شلون دارجه اكثر بالمجتمع عندنا هنا. حيدر ف... شنو تكلفه التست؟ ها؟ شنو تكلفه تعرف؟ 600 دولار. 600 دولار. مو اي مريض عنده بريست كانسر يحتاج انه يسوي جينيتك تيستينج بس اكو الكلاسيفيكيشن اند دكتور كيربي اكشلي شي شيرد لايك ذا ريسك فاكتورز لايك التريجرز او الريسك فاكتورز من انت تشوفها تقدر انه تحول المريض على فمو كل مريض يحتاج انه يسوي جينيتك تيستينج والاديوكيشن اللي اي ثينك جوينج وذ ذات از is is it helps the the the, the families of those patients that do not have cancer اللي ما عندهم كانسر اللي هسه اذا عندها بنات اذا عندها خوات هو هذا البوينت اللي اريد ان اوصل له انه هذول ما عندهم احتمال خلينا نحقهم خلينا نسوي لهم فد يعني فد صوره حتى يكون عندهم انه فد علم بهذا الشيء دولار تكون تسوى اذا واحد يسويها على اذا بيها الامكانيه طبعا لانه ممكن ستارت لايك تيستينج اذر بيبل ان ذا فاميلي بالضبط وشو ما نقول يعني يقدر يلحق روحه يعني يعرف انه اكو هذا الجين ما تبي فد عطب معين او بي فد ميوتيشن معين حتى يتجنبه او حتى فد يسوي فد اجراء هو والطبيب مالته موضوع موجود بالعراق موجود ببغداد موجود عندنا ببغداد اي موجود عندنا ببغداد بعض المختبرات بالتعاون مع يعني مختبرات عالميه طبعا مختبرات عالميه تعرفين هم عندهم في الخريطه للهول جينوم اكزوم يعني للانسان وفيقدون يقارنون البيشنتس هذا عنده صار طفره بهذا الموقع بالكروموسوم هو 13 و17 عندهم هذا الطفره لو ما عندهم الكروموسوم هذا اوكي نورمال لو بيفد جينات اب نورمال صار بها ميوتيشن اللي هي ممكن ان تؤدي الى البريست كانسر او الاوفر اين كانسر. اي مي ذا ديسكشن واز يو نو اي واز اسكينج ذا افيلابيلتي اوف ذا جينوميك تيستينج ان العراق اند سبيشلي ان ذا نورث اوف العراق وير ذا بريفيوس يو نو اتندنت اس ذا كويستشن And what the answer was that is not available in the uh, in other states other than the capital in Baghdad. But the challenge is uh, the cost is approximately $600 uh, you know, uh, there uh, for the family. 
uh, but there is uh, a lack of interest, obviously, because of the cost and uh, some we think it's lack of education about the potential risk and what this uh, genomic testing can offer for some of the high risk. Uh, so that was the side discussion. Amy. I think there is Mohammed Yahya, Rafaida. Fadal Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum. Ahlan wa sahlan. شكرا لاستاذنا على المحاضره الرائعه طبعا وموضوع كلش مهم عن البرس كانسر وحقيقه يعني احنا نواجه هوايه يعني هذا الموضوع كوني اعمل مركز كشف مبكر فهوايه دا اشوف تصادف عندنا حالات يعني برس كانسر ومثل ما تفضل احد في احد المدع يعني المحادثات انه ذكروا انه دا نشوف بعمر ينجر ايج جروب يعني بين ال20 و30 هو كيسات بريست كانسر وهي هاي بصراحه نحتاج احنا جينيتك تيست آه الها فبصراحه يعني هو بالنسبه للجينيتك تيست يعني ما اعرف ذكر الدكتور انه اكو ببغداد على البركه 1 بركه 2 بس احنا ما اعرف بقيه الباب 2 تشيك البتين الكاودن ذن شلون يعني ممكن اكو لهم فحوصات متوفره او لا آه وشغله اريد اسال بالنسبه للفلامتري بريست كارسينوما يعني افتر بيشت افتر ريسيف توما ثيرابي ممكن هي يعني انه يعني ما اعرف اذا الوقت تسمع ممكن انه هي بريست كونسرفتيف سيرجري وراء ما تكمل نيو اجوفنت مؤهله للبريست كونسرفتيف سيرجري سو بالنسبه لسؤالك الاول اخليك انت تتفاهم هي بالنسبه للمختبر ويعني شنو اللي يتوفر في العراق بس خليني افهم سؤالك الثاني السؤال الثاني هو بالنسبه للانفلاماتوري بريست انفلاماتوري بريست كارسينوما وكملت النيو اجوبنت اي تمام ورجعت على مود السيرجري فممكن انه نسوي لها بريست كونسرفاتيف سيرجري لو لازم تكون توتال uh, يعني موديفايد راديكال ماستكتومي اوكي ايمي ذا كويستشن اون ذا فور از بيسكلي فور انفلاماتوري بريست كانسر ذا بيشنت ذات هي هاز ريسيفد نيو اجوبنت ثيرابي And regarding the surgical treatment, is it going to be, you know, conservative lumpectomy, mastectomy, or, you know, lymph node, uh, you know, sentinel lymph node, or, you know, modified radical, what do you recommend for inflammatory breast cancer, surgical approach after neoadjuvant? Um, standard treatment is a modified radical mastectomy. Um, we really don't do sentinel lymph node biopsy in these patients because most will have axillary lymph node metastasis with tumor. Um, we just don't feel like sentinel lymph node biopsy is appropriate. Um, so, um, and breast conservation really is not appropriate because of the extent of the disease, the aggressive nature of these cancers. Um, I think there is a study out of MD Anderson where they tried to do breast conservation in women who had an excellent response to new adjuvant chemotherapy and the outcomes were still poor. So these women, I mean, these are aggressive cancers and they need aggressive surgical treatment. And so I, I routinely do um, modified radical mastectomy. And I, I don't offer these women reconstruction either, immediate reconstruction. Um, Uh, we do delayed reconstruction um, because you really, with the tumor involvement within the skin, you're really trying to remove as much of the skin as you can. Um, and so I, I do not do skin sparing mastectomies and, and reconstruction. Okay. I saw a doctor, can I ask the doctor about the best approach or treatment with the patient? With the granulomatous mastitis, who I know, my jihad, and we are at the presentation, my attitude of shikilam, or chronic, chronic, and I added in. So, granulomatous mastitis, is that the diagnosis? <laughs> granulomatous, no. Okay. Uh, Amy, do you have any experience with granulomatous mastitis? The... Yes, uh, unfortunately, I do. They're very, very difficult to treat. Um, Uh, granulomatous mastitis is it's a it's an inflammatory process in the breast, um, and it presents it looks just like an infection, 
Um, there can be a secondary infection associated with it, but it's, it's not truly an infectious process, even though they frequently will present with what look like abscesses. Um, you know, if, if it looks like there is a secondary infection or an abscess, you have to treat that. Um, but these patients, they don't heal, um, they recur, they have wounds forever. Um, and uh, um, it is more of a, uh, an inflammatory process. Almost, there's some thought it might be somewhat autoimmune. And so a lot of the treatment has centered around steroids um, and uh, uh, treatment um, with autoimmune medications, like even methotrexate. Um, uh, there's some uh, places where they're doing um, catalog injections of the lesions and having good success with that. Um, I recently had a, a case where um, a patient had a, a prolonged um, uh, wound that we couldn't get healed and I put her on an oral course of steroids and it healed up. Um, uh, but these are, yeah, they're very difficult to treat and they tend to recur. Yeah, and Kenalog is a long acting, uh, you know, steroid basically. That's uh -huh. what we have here in the United States. And I think there was another question about the management of uh, ductectasia. Um, so uh, ductectasia in and of itself doesn't really um, need treatment, but um, there is uh, a process of ductal mastitis, or um, there are women who can get chronic recurrent infections, um, uh, particularly women who smoke, where there is damage to the um, distal ducts, um, leading to an environment that's more prone to infection, and women will get recurrent infections from that. Um, and sometimes women can even form a fistula. Um, they'll have a little opening right at the um, edge of the areola that will recurrently become infected or drain, and that's um, called Zuska's disease. Um, and if you um, remove the uh, fistula, uh, a lot of times that will help patients. I, I take them to the operating room and I put a little probe into the um, opening of the um, areola, and the probe frequently will come out um, the nipple and that's the damaged duct. So if you just excise all that tissue, um, it can help resolve the infection, but those, those can be difficult to resolve and treat. And you always have to counsel patients that they need to quit smoking. Amy, I, whether they admit it or not, but this was a very engaging uh, lecture and uh, you can tell from the, you know, the activity and the questionnaire and all that, they were all engaged. You, you provided a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation wealth of knowledge and I really on behalf of everybody and uh, Alia with me and probably she shared the same sentence. Definitely. And, uh, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for okay. this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Faras, I have a question for the last question. Is that right? Yes. Yes, please. Amy, there's one more question apparently. Hey, uh, <laughs> أه واحدة من الحضور فبس دزت لي سؤال أه الليف نايتس اللي موجودة بالبريست دائما تلتهب عندها هل هذا مؤشر على انه اكو خطر عليه بالمستقبل؟ لو لا سو so هل هي يعني بس تلتهب الغدد اللمفاوية بالقبط؟ بال اي بالضبط بالقبط وحول الصدر بالصدر ما اعتقد اكو غدد لمفاوية موجودة هي بالقبط فاذا انا اقدر اقول لك هذا اللي بالنسبه للحضور اذا ماكو اي سبب بالصدر سواء من ناحيه الماموجرام او من ناحيه الالترا ساوند او اللامب او شيء كان هذه ينفتح لاسباب اخرى اللي ابسطها هي تكون انفلاماتوري او او اشياء متعلقه بالغدد اذا بتتكرر وهسه اسالها للدكتوره بس اذا تتكرر اعتقد الحل الامثل انه ياخذون عينه من الغدد اللمفاويه فحسب الدكتور ايمي جاست ذا لاست كويشن ات واز ا بيرسونال كويشن فروم ون اوف ذا اتندنت ذات شي از اكسبيرينسينج اكوردنج تو وات وي اندرستاند از ان ان لمف نود انلارجمنت ان ذا اكسلا بس وذاوت اني ايفيدنس اوف بريست كانسر از ذات ان انديكيشن فور بريست اور يو نو وات تو ميك اوف ات 
Um, well, I mean, it needs to be worked up. So I would do a mammogram and an ultrasound to, um, to work that up and see what the lymph node looks like on imaging. Um, ultrasound's actually really good for evaluating axillary lymph nodes. You can see the architecture of the lymph node. You can see if the um, hilum of the lymph node um, is uh, fatty, um, the thickness of the cortex, and there are different criteria the radiologists use to help determine if the lymph node looks um, suspicious or not. And a lot of you know, fatty and large lymph nodes, you can look at with ultrasound and, and see that they're benign. They're just mainly fatty. And they, you know, these lymph nodes can become, you know, two, three centimeters, but on ultrasound, you can look at them until they're completely benign. Um, but you can also tell if it, you know, if it loses its fatty arc, um, hilum, if it, the cortex gets really thick, and then that would be an abnormal lymph node and would need to be biopsied. Jamie, thank you very much again. I really appreciate it. And uh, Alia, if, uh, I, I was suggesting we both stay on the line if we, the other attendants have any questions. But Amy, thank you uh, again, and uh, I will talk to you later. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Amy. Bye. Have a thank good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Okay. بالنسبة للحضور سويناها ما أعرف إذا أكو نفس الجماعة حضروا من ال حضر السابق بس ال الهدف من هاي المحاضرات او سلسله المحاضرات هو يعني اعطاء الفائده العامه لجميع اهلنا بالعراق بالنسبه للقطاع الطبي. كان عندنا لقاءات متعدده دكتور علياء واني ويا المنظمين بدنا نحاول بشتى الطرق انه نعرف شنو هي المواضيع اللي تهم القطاع العام وعلى مدى نقدر نوصل الفائده العلميه لاكبر عدد ممكن. اللي ما حضروا ببدايه انا يعني جراح تجميل خريج اثنين خريجين العراق دكتور علياء يا اي سند علياء؟ 2004 2004 واخصائيه نسائيه آه انا خلصت سنه 2008 اثنين من اولاد واختصاصي جراحه التجميل. آه يا ريت نسمع من اي الحضور اراءكم عن المحاضره سواء ايجابيه او سلبيه اشياء اللي نقدر نغيرها او نطورها هاي فرصتكم انه نسمع من عندكم ما حد عنده اي تعليق دكتور سمر دكتور سمر اذا تسمعنا سمر ايه لا تسمعنا تفضلي دكتوره سمر السلام عليكم انا دكتوره سمر الشيخلي اهلا وسهلا انا يعني دكتوره سمر الشيخلي اخصائيه جراحه عامه يا اهلا وسهلا يا ريت تعطينا انطباعك عن المحاضره اذا اكو اشياء كانت مهما كانت اذا الاشياء اللي استفاديتي منها الاشياء اللي تعتقدين كانت ما مناسبة نقدر نغيرها أو أي شيء بشكل عام أو بشكل خاص. لا بالعكس عاشت إيديكم حقيقة محاضرة جميلة جدا بال يعني أنا شفت خلينا نقول بالنسبة لي تدري يعني جراحة عامة خلينا نقول هذا مجال اختصاص البريست كانسر كان اكو ابديت بسيط يعني بالنسبه يعني حتى الي انه البيشنت اف شي هاز ا فاميلي هيستوري وي دو سكريننج ان عراق اور اور سكريننج سكريننج بروجرام ان عراق وي دو ا سكريننج فور فور بيشنت 5 ييرز ايرلير تو ذا فيرست ديجري ريليتد بريست كانسر ريليتيف ان يور ليكتشر يو سيد 10 10 ييرز ايرلير تو ذا ايج اوف دايجنوسز اوف فيرست ديجري ريليتيف with CA breast. This is uh, an updating. In Iraq, we do only five years uh, earlier. وحقيقةً شرح الريسك فاكتور وال يعني ال 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 جايد لاين فشي جميل إحنا يعني يعني نوعاً ما خلينا نقول بالعراق ما عدنا ما ما عدنا الجايد لاين ما مطبقة في كل مكان مطبق في مراكز الكشف المبكر إحنا نسميها مراكز كشف الكشف المبكر عن سرطان الثدي موجودة في موجودة في ال 
في المستشفيات والمراكز الصحية لكن إحنا نفتقر إلى تفاعل النساء نفسهم هواية من النساء عندنا يخافون أنه يروحون يسوون يعني الكشف المبكر يعني early screening يخافون لا يتشخصون بالبريست كانسر فدائما تجينا هواية كيسات تكون ادفانس تكون ميتاستسيز فيرتيبرال ميتاستسيز ليفر ميتاستسيز يعني هاي المشكلة اللي نعانيها فكانت معلومات جميلة جدا خصوصا للعاملين في البرايمري هيلث كير سنتر وايضا المودالتيز المودالتيز مال يعني التايب اوف سيرجري for each type of, uh, of uh, يعني each kind of breast like inflammatory CA uh, or other type of uh, breast CA uh, نفتقر إلى شغلة ثانية بالعراق هي الـ يعني الفحوصات الجينية الـ BRCA1 and BRCA2 ما متوفرة في كل مكان في بغداد أنا كتبت لكم بتكلفة عالية جدا يعني الـ بي يعني 1 و 2 تقريبا تكلف حوالي 1000 دولار فمو الكل طبعا يقدرون يسووها وشكرا جزيلا على يعني المحاضرات الجميله والدسكشن واحد يسوي ريفرشمنت للمعلومات مالته والمحاضره ايجابيه بشكل شكرا جزيلا شكرا لمداخلة يعني الدكتور سمر احنا كل شيء من الحقيقه ولو احنا يعني بعدنا متواصلين مع العراق بس من ناحيه العمل الطبي واعتقد الدكتور علياء نفس الشيء منقطعين تماما يعني انا تارك العراق من سنه 91 ما عندي اي معلومه عن الاشياء المتوفره. انا تفاجئت بالعراق يوم التخرج طلعت من العراق يعني بدا يوم جراديويشن كان ظرفنا زين في ذاك الوقت فاحنا الغايه منها يعني ننطيكم اللي موجود حاليا والامل وان شاء الله تحقق انه ترجع الوضعيه مثل الاول بالعراق وتكون متوفره على الاشياء بس على الاقل نريد نقدم الفائده العلميه للحضور انه على الاقل انه تعرف شنو الاشياء اللي نقدر نسويها او المفروض ان نسويها واذا توفرت كان خير على خير. اريد سؤال هل كان اللغه او اسلوب التقديم مناسب؟ هل هو كان سريع هل انه اللغه كانت مفهومه لحد ما او صعبه؟ مناسب مناسب اوكي اللي اليوم كانت كلش مناسبه يعني الصوت واضح وكانت اللقاء مالها بطيء ابطا من اللي قبلها كانت اسرع كانت أنا أعتقد أولاً يعني اختلاف بالبرسوناليتي وبنفس الوقت حكيت وياها يعني حاولنا إنه عاشت إيدك بسرعة نشوف الدكاترة إذا عندهم فد مواضيع يقترحوها علينا حتى نشتغل عليها الأسابيع الجاية يا مواضيع تهمكم أنا الصراحة يعني وصلني لست بالمواضيع النسائية واحدة من المواضيع اللي قلت أبلش بيها لأنه it's a very important topic وممكن أنه مثل ما يقولون نقلل المشاكل المضاعفات هو البري كلامسيا لانه كاتبي لي اكلامسيا سو اني اي ثينك انه اكو هواي كيسز اوف اكلامسيا بالعراق اند بالموضوع النسائي اي ثينك فيري ريرلي لازم نوصل للاكلامسيا سو so, بل قلت ابلش بهالموضوع والموضوع الثاني هو ابنورمال يوترين بلينينج مانجمنت بس اذا اي احد عنده شيء من اللي يقدرون يسوون لنا اياها بلسته ويبعثوا لنا اياها بس اكيد اذا يحبون يكتبون هنا على الشات ويل بي نايس اوكي هل انه المواضيع الاخرى يعني هل تشيست بين هل انه ستروك هل مواضيع جي اي بليدنج هل مواضيع يعني انكولوجي ذات الحقيقه احنا يعني المواضيع نقدر نقدر نتواصل ويا كثير من الاخصائيين بس يعني واحد من الناس مثلا كان يريد يحكي على موضوع جدا معين انا برايي بس ويجوز انا غلطان انه نريد نعمم الفائده على الكل ممكن انه شخص معين يستفاد من هذاك الموضوع المختص جدا بس اعتقد انه المفروض يكون الماده اكثر عامه وتغطي شريحه يعني اوسع
Okay, cervical cancer, cervical cancer screening updates. Okay. Um, um, and management of granulomatous mastitis. Now, yeah. we touched base a little bit earlier. Yeah. We don't lecture Kamla on this topic. اعتقد ان تكون جدا معين ومطوعه نادر ممكن دكتور عن يزينا شلون دكتور علي دكتور ليه يزينا انا عام او ابديت بموضوع طبي خلينا نقول عام مو بتخصص معين عم بالفائده تكون اكثر هو يكون هو يفضل فمثل ما قالت الدكتوره سمر هي الغرض من المحاضرات هاي هو ابديت على كل شيء طبي ده يصير برا والمشاكل الجديده اللي قاعده تطلع عندنا بالعراق فالمواضيع الطبيه كلها راح نجمعها كلها من الامرجنسي كل التخصصات ونحط احنا بعد جدول شلون حتكون المحاضرات ومن ويا حضراتكم من راح ينطيها مثل ما اتفقنا احنا باوغست شنو راح تكون المحاضرات وان شاء الله الفائده للكل يعني حنغطي نحاول نغطي كل شيء ان شاء الله نحاول نغطي كل شيء بما انه اكو فائده واكو اسئله هوايه من الاطباء الموجودين وحيكون ابديت لهم هو هذا الغرض من المحاضرات فان شاء الله نحاول نجمعها وابعثها لكم اول باول ونتفق على اي محاضره تكون واحنا نسوي الاعلان ونبعثها لهم وهم حتى الوقت احنا راعينا ظروفهم انه يكون الوقت مناسب انه يكونون بالبيت وخلصوا شغل كل هذا الغرض ما عنده درسنا انه هاي الفائده مالته بس اذا هم عندهم مقترحات ثانيه يجون ينطوها يا ريت يكتبون اياها بالكومنت انا دا اخذها بنظر الاعتبار دا اسجلها يمي فعم نحاول انه تكون الفائده عامه وشكرا لكم اليوم كانت بديع المحاضره ثانك يو شكرا يعني زينا وشكرا لكل الحضور احنا بخدمتكم وان شاء الله نلتقي بكم بعد جمعتين ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله صباح على خير مع السلامة. مع السلامة. مع السلامة. بس خلي أجاوب. دكتور علي باقي بال بالبرصة ها. لا تقدر يعني تتوكل. بالنسبه للاعلان على المحاضرات اللي دا يسال عليها اكو بيج على الفيسبوك وايضا اكو جروب على التليجرام هسه راح اعطيكم اياها خليها انزلها بالشات بالنسبة للمختبر دكتور محمد بالحارفية مختبر كروان مختبر كروان تخصصي عندهم فحوصات جينية مو بس على جماعة البريست كانسر لا عندهم هواي بانالات يعني جينيتك ديسيز او هذا هسه اشوفك البيج مالهم ايضا على الفيس وبي الرقم تليفونهم تقدر تتواصل وياهم آه هذا آه بيج اللي نخلي عليه الاعلانات مال المحاضرات اسمه الفا
هذا اللينك مال الجروب مال تيليجرام وايضا يتم به الاعلان على المحاضرات دكتور محمد دزت لك اياه الجروب مال المختبر او البيج مال المختبر كروان وانا موجود هناك الاثنين والثلاثاء اذا تحب انا موجود واي معلومات انا موجود نلتقيكم ان شاء الله بمحاضره الجايه تصبحون على خير وكل عام وانتم بخير وعيدكم مبارك ان شاء الله مع السلامه